This film is an introduction to Geneva Conventions. Most of the time when you look at the daily language of how people are using the word refugee, they use it for anybody who's running from war or persecution or a natural disaster, they call it a refugee. But in fact, when we look at international law, refugee is a legal status that has emerged after World War II with the Geneva Convention. After the Second World War, you see countries coming together and saying, what do we do when there are thousands of people moving away from conflicts, when there are thousands of people who have to find a new home outside of their country? C'est donc un devoir impérieux d'élaborer en temps de paix des conventions protégeant les victimes de la guerre. Reconnaître ce devoir ne signifie pas que nous ne souhaitions pas ardemment que la guerre puisse être définitivement éliminée du destin de tous les peuples. When the Geneva Convention was signed in 1951, it was for the realities of World War II. Based on the 1951 UN Refugee Convention, there are certain criteria to be fulfilled to be eligible to get a refugee, legal refugee status. So there are certain criteria that the uh, authorities look for in order to determine someone's refugee status. So this can be either because of political conflict, such as war, but it can also be because of natural disaster or because of a certain persecution due to their identity, such as the case for a lot of LGBT individuals. I guess uh, even though the criteria very well reflect the situation back in the uh, 1950s, it may not be the situation in the next 10, 20 years. Some people in the South Pacific could become the world's first climate change refugees because of rising sea levels. About 100,000 people live in the low-lying island nation of Kiribati. In my words, a refugee is someone who is fleeing some sort of persecution, violence, conflict, uh, whether it be a war, whether it be something about themselves as a person or their political views that has brought them into a situation where they can no longer be safe. But underneath this sociological concept, we can say that every refugee is a migrant, but not every migrant is a refugee, though. Of course, there are also many migrants trying to get to Europe via these dangerous overwater routes. But most of the people we're hearing about on the news are refugees, and the distinction is incredibly important. So a migrant is someone who crosses a border. Now, an asylum seeker is someone who moves across a border by force. Anybody who is running away from war, let's say, or from persecution can apply for a refugee status. During that time, that person has to be called an asylum seeker. Because you always run the risk of applying for asylum but not being granted it. So you have this period where you're in limbo and those are the ones who are asylum seekers. People assume that anybody that comes actually gets an automatic status, which is not true at all. But what is happening is what we see in the media, for example, anybody who takes on the boat to cross the Aegean to go to Greece or to Europe, they call it a refugee, but in fact, they are really asylum seekers seeking some kind of a safe haven. In many places, actually, people do go through a process, and that's the refugee application, the claiming process. And, and very often, that their claims actually are, are rejected and they're deported and, and they're sent back. Amid public fears over mass migration and criticism of Angela Merkel's liberal asylum policies, Germany's list of so-called safe countries of origin is growing, meaning that if your country is on that list, you're unlikely to be granted asylum. Still, the German government has not budged on its deportation policy. Afghan refugees can be sent back. This, human rights groups strongly disagree with. That's because those laws prohibit deportation to unsafe countries. The German government, however, says parts of Afghanistan are safe, even if 
fact, the country as a whole is not. For instance, Afghans, they are in a very bad situation because UNSCR has stopped looking at their files because they think that there is no ongoing conflict in Afghanistan they can, they can return back to their countries because the country is now is not safe. The government is more cautious when it comes to its own citizens visiting Afghanistan. Violence affects all parts of the country, according to the Foreign Office's long-standing travel warning. Yeah, I think that's very pertinent. Uh, it was certainly more dangerous to be a citizen in Nice last year than in, in Kabul. Well, well, clearly that is a political statement and the facts do not back it up. Just last year, the UN assistance mission to Afghanistan, so UNAMA, released a report in February 2017 where they reported that it was the highest rate of incidents against civilians ever recorded by the UN. Uh, so I think, again, we have the facts to be able to know uh, that the security is only getting worse. There are also a lot of people who could not cross that international border. I mean, there are as much as internally displaced people in Syria as the refugees. I mean, the difference is, as I said, for the Geneva Convention, to be able to seek a refugee status, you have to cross an international border. There is no one single treaty that tells us the rights of migrants that has not been able to be achieved, whereas the UN actually quite successfully made this for refugees. Uh, even if it's argued to be uh, outdated, etc., etc., there's still a legal framework that tells the states what to do. Geneva has been a very useful concept for a long time, but one wonders whether it is really applicable today. Poland's government has long been proud of its st strong stance against migration. While other European nations welcomed in hundreds of thousands of people who fled war, Poland stood firm with its borders firmly closed. So the UN. I think has played an important role in terms of engineering this, you know, whole process. But obviously its hands are quite tied when it comes to countries taking the responsibility and fulfilling their obligation. For example, Turkey. It has been a signatory of the Geneva Convention and it has accepted the additional protocols, but Turkey has a geographical limitation on the convention. It said, OK, I can lift the time limitation, but I cannot lift the geographical limitation. For me, a refugee is somebody who would come from Europe, Europe meaning the OECD countries. The influx of refugees has swelled Shanluka's population by nearly a third and that's meant that Turkish authorities have had to evolve and adapt their policies to cope. Well, I think in Europe we're looking at a different situation because in Europe there is a more structurally organized process. In Turkey, um, Syrians' legal status is very ambiguous, so they're under temporary protection, so that's an internationally legal and recognized uh, status, but it doesn't actually give any pathways to further status in Turkey. Syrians are now under what's called temporary protection status, and that means they will not be forced to go home. With this massive influx of Syrian sort of refugees into Turkey, the country had to develop a status. So in 2014, the country developed this temporary protection status, which actually allows to access certain services in the field of, for example, health and education, but it is not a refugee status. And then you have these economic migrants who are considered to move due to poverty. If your livelihood is in danger, so consider you are a farmer, but your fields have been dried up due to climate change or your country building certain dams and there's no water coming into your region. Can you really say that this person is not also forced? People flee for mixed reasons. Often they are fleeing forms of individual persecution. For instance, they may be fleeing warfare or they may also be fleeing economic hardship. And often uh, economic insecurity and conflict often go hand in hand. In the end, I think it's very hard at this time to say that there's a difference between a person who is fleeing for economic or political reasons. But in fact, there is no such concept of economic refugee in the international law. So we have to call them migrants per se. And another thing is it's very difficult to distinguish who is the bona fide refugee. For instance, if you look in EU member states, one nationality, for instance, if you take the case of Afghans, have a higher chance of being accorded refugee status in certain member states, like France, than they do in Germany. So obviously we can see that this category is highly political. For instance, look at the, the policies of European countries. They are giving all these uh, opportunities to investors, regardless they are coming from uh, Muslim countries or not. But for the uh, you know refugees or um, or for other like labor migrants, they do not give the same uh, similar opportunities. We also see a talk of deservingness. One refugee is more deserving of protection 
than another. I think then this distinction is also very problematic. I mean, who is the deserving refugee and who is the undeserving migrant? I want to play more of what President Trump said today when he explained why he's going to give Christian refugees a priority. Do you know, if you were a Christian in Syria, it was impossible, very, very, at least very, very tough to get into the United States. If you were a Muslim, you could come in. Now, often the refugee that's the most deserving is either the one that's most traumatized or most vulnerable, or the person who can contribute most to the new country that they're moving into. But what the Geneva Convention really says is that any person who is fleeing from violence or political persecution deserves a new home. Uh, Donald Trump is implying, actually he's more than implying, he's saying in a statement that the U.S. made it more difficult for Christians to come in than Muslims. The, the fact is the U.S. does not look at religion. It does not give Christian or Muslim a benefit. It looks at the status of the refugee. We are really asking people to convince the authorities to make sure that their claims for a refugee status is accepted. But of course it is doubling the trauma for them. We have to accept that it's for the asylum seeker to be able to prove their claim. What I have an, an issue with is that in a lot of decisions, the Home Office decision makers are applying too high a standard of proof. And now we have this battlefield saying, well, prove that you're gay. Habina Sekboro and Adaronke Apata could never walk hand in hand in Nigeria. Both claim they were tortured there for being lesbians. Adaronke says she was sentenced to death by stoning, but has twice had her asylum claim rejected. The more traumatized that person is in their own country and the more they could prove that, provide evidence, the more likely that they will get the status. People have told me that they've gone to the extent of producing video of themselves that's, and their partner that are making love to show to the Home Office to be able to prove their sexuality. And I think that is homophobic. It is degrading. At the same time, those who have more capital, social or financial capital, they also make their way into the system much more easily. The ones, for instance, established restaurants uh, or businesses are not faced with the kind of racism because seen as they are contributing to the economy as well. But on the other hand, the ones who are working in the informal sector are seen as they are taking jobs and they are taking all the resources from the state. Whereas the ones who are established businesses, they are seen as their contributors. When we are talking about the migrants or refugees or Syrians, we are always talking as if we are talking about an homogeneous group. But in fact, this is not an homogeneous group. The idea of refugees is quite monolithic or singular. We think often a relatively uneducated, poor male person, but this is an extremely diverse group of people. So what I'd like to see is that we recognize how diverse the group of refugees is. So this goes for cultural diversity, religious, national, but also in terms of socioeconomic status. That's why we need to just understand that we are here having a very diversified group, diversified in terms of socioeconomic status, diversified in terms of educational profile, also diversified you know, concerning their religion, even religious sect. That's why we need policy innovations you know, that is sort of matching the needs, qualifications of the diverse refugee groups.